A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Hey, a conversation over this next hour. Well, no one thought we would be having this conversation. Our special guest has been one of those great champions of marriage and family issues, the pro-life cause, and really going back well over the last decade. You might remember him as one of the champions of the marriage debate. You know, marriage between one man and one woman, the No campaign, that debate going back to 2017 now. Damien Wilde from the Australian Family Coalition had been a frequent guest on 2020 with some of, I might even describe, some of the best insights into a Christian view of our changing world. Well, the Australian Family Coalition had been a growing network, uh, around 50,000 grassroots subscribers and supporters. But then something significant happened late last year. Damien resigned all his roles in November. His body riddled with cancer and a brain tumour that put him just days away from death. He'd made his farewells. He'd put his affairs in order and even a palliative care team visited to ask where he wanted to die. But here's the good news today. We're not talking about Damien Wilde. We're talking to Damien Wilde. Damien Wilde is back at the helm, leading the Australian Family Coalition. And uh, it's an organisation all about defending the family and promoting society grounded on conservative Christian values and aspiring to safeguard our basic freedoms. Absolute privilege today to be able to welcome to 2020 and welcome back to Damien Wilde. Neil, it's an absolute, absolute privilege to be back, and I certainly didn't didn't uh, ever think I'd be speaking with you again and the, the good listeners, but here I am, and, and how wonderful it is. Damien, I remember my heart sunk uh, when I read your farewell email late last year. You described that as one of the hardest things that you've ever had to write. I wonder if you can take us back to how you were feeling at the lowest point of your journey. Certainly, Neil. Um, and it's a difficult one to experience again, to be honest, to, to go through those different emotions and feelings uh, because obviously there were the physical issues I had to deal with, the emotional issues I had to deal with. Um, my body was not in a good place. Um, it was getting tired, fatigued. I was struggling to get through the day, to be honest. Um, in terms of emotionally, you know, try to talk to everybody from my colleagues to my children to get everything in order, as you said, it was a very difficult, very difficult time, um, not knowing what might be around the corner on a daily basis uh, and just trying to live for the moment, really. And right at the beginning of our conversation, I know you're not out of the woods yet, uh, but there's been some significant uh, developments. Um, I mentioned there in the introduction, last November, your body was riddled with cancer. I wonder if you can describe just how significant all that was because you had a brain tumour as well and, and some of those things have subsided, but uh, where, where were things at? And uh, we'll get onto the journey of how things have changed so dramatically, but take us back to how bad things were. Well, I guess I'd been lowered into a bit of a false sense of security because a stage four melanoma is normally something that can increase in size quite rapidly. We found it around Australia Day last year. And by November, I still seemed relatively well. I'd been working, um, I'd been attending church functions and so on, and I actually ducked away from church on a Sunday morning to go and have my quarterly scans, and I was actually at a church picnic when the call came through from the oncologist, and I said, it must be pretty bad if you're calling me on a Sunday morning, and he said, you have no idea. He said, basically, we've lost all control, it's shifted across the midline of your brain, this is really, really bad. And I said, okay, understood. And I started taking all of the steps that he he told me to. And then separately, he phoned my wife. And I thought, why on earth would you phone her? You know, why not? And he said, look, I need to impose upon, impress upon you just how serious this is. Damien is days away from death. Um, you really need to get everything sorted. So to go from there to suddenly where I was at the next lot of scans in January was just mind-blowing because we saw a 50% reduction in the size of the brain tumour. My brain had gone back to a relatively normal state uh, and subsequent scans have shown similar reductions to the point now where my body is now utterly free of cancer but for one small lesion in the head. 
Let me ask you about your faith in all of this, because as a, a Christian man of God, and uh, you come from a Catholic background, and uh, you even received the last rites, a priest obviously came around and said, uh, this is it, Damien, uh, let's go through a, a last rites uh, that you do when you're, you're about to die. Um, but you were just days away from death. What does this do for your faith when you know that in just days you'll be standing before your Creator? There's so much emotion in that, Neil. Uh, in, in terms of what it looks like practically, it was a, a very strange thing to experience. You know, I have seen all the different aspects of my faith at work in my lifetime. I'd seen the anointing of the sick and so on, but I'd never actually seen the last rites. I'd heard about it. I'd never seen it. And then, of course, the first time I witnessed it was my own, lying there on what could have been my deathbed, literally. And the priest asked me, you know, would you like the children to leave the room? This can be a little bit difficult for people. It can be a bit harrowing. And I said, that's probably a good idea. So after we all prayed as a family, they left. But then, interestingly, as I heard the prayers, which talked about being welcomed into heaven, I thought to myself, there's nothing harrowing here at all. This is wonderful stuff. This is lovely stuff. And at any other time of my life in different circumstances, I'd be quite ready to to do just that. But, you know, in the very conversational prayers I, I guess I had with God at that time, the circumstances were quite different. Um, I was not young. I was not single. I was a, a, a married father of seven. And that changes your perspective on life quite differently. So I think while a Christian at any other time, you know, would not be afraid to go and meet their maker, uh, well prepared to do so, you know, I, I guess I didn't feel like my my time here was quite done yet and I had things I wanted to hang around for. Do you experience uh, when you've got that sort of bad news, um, what we all might appreciate as something of the peace of God? And, uh, and it's interesting, whether you're Catholic or whether you're Protestant, uh, whether it's the priest that's coming to your bedside or whether it's the pastor who's there uh, and with encouraging words from Scripture, um, how, does, how does that all, all, all work? The peace of God that passes all understanding. And we all might hope that in that day when we're facing our final breath, uh, that we might experience that peace of God. Was this something that you experienced? In a way, Neil, in a way. I mean, I know that spiritually and in myself I was prepared. Um, having the the anxiety of leaving my family behind was always an issue. And I guess, you know, even to make sure that things like the Australian Family Coalition would, would kick on without me uh, were always back of mind. So I'd like to pretend that I was completely... <laughs> completely at peace but i guess you know out of me was always concerned for the things i would leave behind but ultimately i think having having faith in god's plan and knowing that he's in charge ultimately um it does cause you to um rely and trust in ways that perhaps you haven't had to before and you mentioned you're married and a father of seven and uh, it, sometimes you know when we're reflecting on dying we're interested in you know how you were feeling but you were also observing what for a lot of families can be quite traumatic this sort of bad mm. news comes and i wonder if you've got any reflection there that as a man of faith as uh, someone who's been a a warrior in the battle for righteousness and uh, and the name of Christ being centred at all you do and your family then going through this experience. Um, they might have been asking, you know, where's God in all of this? Uh, why are they going to take my dad? How do you reflect on your family and how they would have been reacting to this bad news? Very interesting, Neil, because having so many children and having them all at different ages of, of their lives, they all had a very different level of understanding I think certainly for the older ones, the teenagers, they might have been asking those questions, um, but I think perhaps they saw the uh, the way I handled it and we had those sorts of discussions. And I don't think there were ever those doubts or senses of anger and frustration, perhaps sadness at what could have been, you know, when everyone sort of thought that I was slipping away. Um, for the, the children in the middle, uh, Perhaps there was a bit of an understanding that daddy's sick, but maybe it's just a cold or something. He'll be better this week. And for the younger ones, perhaps very little understanding at all. Um, you know, perhaps one of the most scary thoughts I had was that 
our youngest, who was only two when I was diagnosed, might never know me. And that was a, a really horrifying thought. Um, and I guess one of the motivations to putting faith aside in a human sense, do everything physically possible to try and keep myself alive for my children. Um, but those difficult discussions, you know, we certainly had, and I think the children at their different levels of understanding, you know, it, it was wonderful how the family came together. Um, they, they tried to help more around the house. Um, they contributed more at prayer time. Um, so I'd like to think it had good effects too. Damien, I said at the beginning, you know, no one expected us to be having this conversation today. And I know that it's like a miracle that we are, in fact, talking uh, here at this time of the year and uh, having gone through all of the challenges that you've been through and then you're bouncing back. When you reflect on what's happened to you, do you say this is a miracle? Uh, do people have that miracle conversation with you? I think moving in the circles I do, that's the first thing that comes to everybody's lips. Um, speaking to so many Christians, the very first thing they want to say is this is this is divine, this is miraculous. Uh, I'll have to take a step back because I just don't know. And I know that God works through human instruments. So whether we want to put it down to um, some of the treatment I've received of different types, because I've certainly done many, many different things, as you can imagine, uh, everything that was physically possible. Um whether we put it down to divine intervention or to human means, I know that ultimately God is behind everything. Um, whether he you know, chooses to use the, the things we ingest, the treatments we go through, or whether it is something simply miraculous, I know that God's behind it all, and that's a great comfort at the end of the day. He's the one who receives all glory and honour, and I know you give glory to God. I do want to open our talkback line, and for listeners to participate in a conversation like this, you might have your own question you'd like to ask Damien, or you might have a comment around the sorts of things that you can see are reflected in his story. Do you know that Damien is back at the helm, leading the Australian Family Coalition? We're going to talk about that just ahead because uh, this is a very powerful thing that's actually happened here and uh, we might be anticipating there are some good things ahead. Damien Wilde is our guest. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316 and we're back with more in just a few moments. Vision Christian Radio bumper stickers are a practical way to show the world how much you love vision. New stickers are available now. Choose the I Love Vision sticker or your local frequency and proudly display your affiliation with Australia's National Christian Radio Network. It's more than just a sticker, it's a statement and might help someone you'll never meet discover vision and start looking to God daily. Whether you're parked or cruising through town, Vision Bumper Stickers will turn heads and spark conversations. Stick it, show it, and let everyone know you're tuned to Vision. Available now at vision.org.au slash stickers. Order your Vision Bumper Sticker today. Biblical history is unfolding before our eyes, and Israel is at the centre of it all. Station sponsor Christians for Israel Australia's free newspaper, Israel and Christians Today, can help you better understand these days we're living through. This free newspaper will keep you updated and informed about Israel and how believers can care for the Jewish people around the world. Subscribe for your free copy of Israel and Christians Today at c4israel.com.au. That's the letter C, the number 4, israel.com.au. Visions 2020 with Neil Johnson, a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. Our special guest this hour is Damien Wilde. He's back at the helm, leading the Australian Family Coalition. From being just days away from dying, there's been a dramatic turnaround and uh, you heard us reflecting on the thought of a miracle. You might even have your own thoughts around uh, miracles. And uh, we're talking about Damien and he's uh, bounced back. I, I want to ask you, Damien, before we take any calls, uh, but 1-800-316-316, Damien, when you wrote this letter saying you're back in charge at AFC, you have a C.S. Lewis quote. Uh, the world might stop in 10 minutes. Meanwhile, we are to go on doing our duty. The great thing is to be found at one's post. 
As a child of God, living each day as though it were our last, but planning as though our world might last a hundred years. A wonderful quote from C.S. Lewis and clearly very meaningful to you in the decisions that you've had to make of recent days and uh, and move back into a position of responsibility. Absolutely, Neil. I mean, I first stumbled across that quote by chance, probably something like 20 years ago, and I reflect on it from time to time. Um, I guess the the temptation might have been there after what I've experienced just to count my blessings and, and lead a very simple life. You know, I think I could quite happily uh, get away with convalescing, sitting in my backyard, planting some veggies and, and counting my blessings. But you know, I can't help but feel that if God has given me this second chance, that I should use it, uh, use it to his glory. And, you know, in whatever way I can contribute, as long as I can, because I'm certainly not out of the woods, are we ever really? We never know when the world might for us personally. It could be today, it could be tomorrow. And I feel that using our time wisely is something we should do. Getting back to your post, I mean, this is a powerful concept, especially in God, because sometimes we hold a position of responsibility. Something happens that either takes us out not by our own decision, uh, but sometimes because we've decided just to let go and let someone else go and do that, if they feel called, well, that's all very fine. Uh, but recognizing that you have some gifts, that you have some talents, that you are, uh, you know, under God's blessing in some ways to be able to articulate the things that you're able to do on so many different levels, to recognize that this is your post and you need to get back to it. It's something that perhaps we all grapple with from time to time, but but getting back into the thing that you're gifted for, this is a powerful concept. Well, certainly, and as much as we can. I mean, I'm not the most eloquent. I'm not the greatest lobbyist. I'm not the greatest organiser. But I'm there. And we're all able to do what we can. We've all been given gifts and talents. And who are we really to hide them under a bushel at the end of the day? Well, let's take some calls. 1-800-316-316. Anne is in Labrador. Hi, Anne. Welcome along. Hi, I just want to encourage him. I have a lady in our church and she was diagnosed of cancer and they gave her last Christmas to live and the Lord totally healed her. And we had her um, up there and, and giving a testimony of how great God was. So it's not just you. I've, I've experienced this with this lady because she was in our group as well. We go to on a Thursday night. So it was just lovely, you know, to be able to um, know for you to know that you're not the only one that God has uh, miraculously uh, healed. And wonderful thoughts. Uh, Damien, a response for Anne? I appreciate uh, that sh- story being shared with me. And, you know, at the very least, I would like to think that my own story can perhaps be an encouragement to others too. You know, we're all not guaranteed a cure. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. But if my story can help others, particularly those who are doing it tough, uh, then that's really encouraging. Uh, thank you, Anne from Labrador, one eight hundred three sixteen three sixteen to join in our conversation. Damien, what do we do with this thought? God's not finished with me yet. Uh, is this something that uh, has come over you uh, since you know you were days away from dying, and today, as we're talking, and uh, and I've said uh, miraculously in that sense of we didn't think we'd be talking today, but here we are. Uh, God's not finished with you yet. He has something more on your assignment. There's more in your agenda still to come. How do you reflect on that? Well, for me personally, I I very much believe that's the case. I wouldn't be back on deck. I wouldn't be writing emails. I wouldn't be doing radio interviews if I didn't think so. Um, You know, I don't believe it's arrogant to say that. I I feel that, you know, if if God has granted me more time, then I should use it wisely, as per the C.S. Lewis quote. I think for any person, though, you know, We're not guaranteed tomorrow, as I said before, but using our time wisely is something we should all do. God is never finished with us. And even, I guess, when I was at my worst in November last year, I felt that perhaps, you know, even if I was called to, dare I say, die well, uh, you know, to to show people that we can still be uh, people of faith and trust, even at our darkest moments. So whatever purpose God had in store for me, to try and live that well. And, of course, uh, very mindful that there are those who have a uh, a terminal uh, cancer diagnosis and they don't bounce back. Uh, they actually do die. 
How do you reflect on that now? Because uh, some will was some might be thinking, well, you know, here's Damien with a special privilege, and when we talk about you know God not being finished with me yet, uh, this is really in the realms of the miraculous. But uh, not everybody does bounce back. Have you come across people in conversation and they said, oh, my uncle or my auntie or my parents or my children, they didn't bounce back from this. And and here you are with this extra opportunity that God isn't finished with you yet. That's a very good question, Neil. And I have to be very sensitive when I speak to some of these people because I, you know, I don't want to rub it in their face that I've had something that's basically miraculous when they've had something so challenging and so difficult. And they're asking the questions, you know, why are you and why not my brother? Why not my auntie? Why not my wife? Um, these are very difficult conversations to have. Uh, and I think for them and for me, we all have to look to the fact that God has a plan and we need to trust in that, uh, that God's timings and ways are not our own. Um I've been asked whether I have survivor's guilt. You know, I don't know whether you're familiar with that term. I don't think I do, but I, I certainly do think it's caused me to reflect on why me, and it causes me to to come to the conclusion that God's not finished with me yet, and He must have some other purpose. And I've not been so familiar with that term, survivor's guilt. Uh, in other words, hey, you've been the recipient of being mm-hmm. able to bounce back and we can give glory to God and uh, and someone will come along and say, don't you feel guilty that you've been a recipient of a good <laughs> thing here? Uh, so, yes, yeah, survivor's guilt. And there might be listeners who have their own reflection on that. To come back to the thought that you're not out of the woods yet. Uh, the cancer's not completely gone uh, is it described as being in remission? Is that the way doctors talk about you, Damien? Well, I think I'm, I'm beyond almost complete evidence of disease. You can get to a cure bar one lesion. And that, of course, is a concern, particularly given it's still in the back of my head. Um, if it weren't for that, I'd basically be able to say that I'm borderline cured. Unfortunately, I'm not. But on the closest thing possible, it's just one bit left. And compared to where I was in November, let's say, when things were at their worst, I mean, it wasn't just a brain tumour and an edema, which took up a quarter of my brain capacity, um, cavity, I should say. Um, It was through my lungs. It was through my lymphatic system. If you could have seen a picture, it would have been quite horrifying. So, you know, look, we've, we've come a long way. We're not quite there yet. Damien, before we take any calls, I wonder whether, just in a nutshell, the journey from, well, November last year, when you were given this diagnosis, uh, get your affairs in order, your days away from dying, uh, through what has happened since then up to the present, uh, for listeners to understand the context of where the journey's going so far, how do you describe what what happened in a quick uh, timeline? <laughs> Well, um, from Australia Day last year, when I first found out that I had cancer through to uh, November, it was already a very strange experience where things didn't move perhaps as, well, they didn't deteriorate as quickly as they could have. But by November, things had got out of all control. I was given that that information that I was days away from death, get your house in order, through to January when the brain tumour alone shrank 50% to August, Easter week, in fact, it had shrunk a further 50%. Uh, to July this year, the most recent set of scans where other than one small little lump in my head, my entire body was free of cancer, which was just an astonishing turnaround. Uh, And the only word I can use to sum all of this up is gratitude. Is there any special medical attention that you received? Was there something experimental that uh, you were on? Uh, Are the doctors that were attending to your cancer were they especially gifted in some ways how do you reflect on on some of the things that might be connected to treatments that's a good question neil because as you can imagine i've had a conga line of people asking me what did you do and it's through that that you realize just how much cancer affects people you know everybody seems to know someone if they're not personally affected themselves um i I preface anything i say by saying that i'm not a doctor this is not to be taken as medical advice but you know, we've done a combination of mainstream uh, treatment, alternative treatment, you might say, and a whole lot of prayer. Because people have asked me, what do I attribute it to? And it's not for me, I guess, at the end to say, but I'm, I'm sure that all three of those things have had a huge impact. Uh, some of the more mainstream things I've done, and I, I point out that I've not had chemo or, or surgery or anything of the sort. Um, some of the medications I've been on um, have only been around for a few years, um, and therefore people who... Ironically, I have a particular mutation of my 
my cancer that just a few years ago would have been a death sentence. It grows at a speed and ferocity that would have killed me in weeks or months. But it allows now uh, these new medications which can block the pathways that cancer used to feed, feed itself, which is quite astonishing. Uh, so that combined with some other things has really allowed uh, my body, I think, to get back on front foot and, and to fight it in a way that it wasn't able to previously. Uh, but as I said, I'm sure that prayers played a, a huge part in this as well. Uh, well, prayers, uh, certainly when we talk about miracles, um, you've got prayers and you've got a divine intervention. Uh, prayers also lead us to have the mind of God and uh, wise decisions about what sort of treatments we might choose. Uh, you mm-hmm. might be familiar, there's quite a controversy on right now. Elle McPherson, the very well-known uh, supermodel, uh, Aussie supermodel, uh, she's gone through some alternative treatments and uh, really uh, rejected some of the things that the medical establishment were telling her to do. And, uh, and, and there's controversy around that now as to what way you choose. But I wonder, I'm not wanted to draw you into a whole lot of commentary around uh, around these sorts of things, except to say uh, you obviously have have understood what's out there and you've chosen what you felt was a wise path uh, to choose for treatment and and it's come good. Absolutely. And I think, you know, again, without going down the rabbit hole that we could of uh, health issues over the last few years with the COVID issue and whatnot, I think we need to get back to a place where we do respect people's autonomy a lot more, especially their medical autonomy, uh, to make decisions that they feel are right for them. Um, And I'm not going to go into what is right or wrong, only that we do need to respect those sorts of boundaries and to allow people to make decisions that they're comfortable with. Uh, Also to realise that cancer is not a a one-size-fits-all disease. You know, there are many different types of cancer. People have unique genetics and it can affect them in different ways. And without going into too much detail, uh, we've gone to extraordinary lengths to actually explore my own genetics with reputable uh, tests and so on that can be done to work out what might uh, have greater impact and what would have lesser impact and, frankly, what wouldn't work at all. And that allowed us to cross a lot of things off and not waste our time, which was really good. Uh, We're taking calls on 1-800-316-316. Let's take a call. Tony is in Mount Barker. Hello, Tony. Welcome. Oh, hello there. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Tony? We're actually in a place called Strathalban, which is about 30 k's from a little country place from Mount Barker in South Australia. But uh, congratulations, Damien. I think it's fantastic that you got through the journey, mate. Fantastic. That's very kind of you. And being an Adelaidean, I know Mount Barker very well. Oh, good, good, good. Well, just a quick <laughs> call. Uh, I was given 12 months to live and... Uh, uh, back in the year 2000, the year of the Olympics, actually. And um, the naturopath that helped me, uh, the medical uh, person, a uh, specialist, gave me 12 months. I was sitting in a room with a whole lot of students. You probably can relate to what I'm going to be saying, but uh, it was very cold in the in the RAH. And they, uh, when most people have got cancer, they want to know how long they live and what, what, what are your options, of course, you know. And uh, anyway, before I went to that meeting, I was in the... Uh, botanical gardens in, in in Adelaide and I had a very clear vision with the Lord walking with me and my naturopath and my two children across the Red Sea. The Lord parted the sea for me to walk through that. When I got to the other side, we looked back and we saw these black mice or rats were following me uh, viciously and uh, that represented to me cancer. Really serious about get, getting a hold of me. But the Lord put up his hand and the water drowned every single rat in the sea. And uh, uh, I was that was the vision I got. I really felt I should share that with you. Um, God's good, <laughs> that's for sure. Tony, thank you so much for calling in. And uh, there's a little insight there, isn't there, into what goes on in our hearts and our minds when we're faced with the trauma of a cancer diagnosis and the possibility of dying and the way that our hearts might be encouraged and uh, this sort of image of, uh, you know, the parted sea and then the rats and uh, God's hand saying uh, no further. Uh, those sorts of things, and some people might say that's a little bit like a an hallucination and uh, I'm not sure what you're going to be saying here, uh, Damien, but what are your thoughts here for Tony and, and the encouragement he had from that what you might even call a vision? 
Well, it's actually touched on something very close to my heart, Neil. Um, this is not something I've shared too widely, but perhaps this is the time and place to do so. You know, for much of my life, I, I wouldn't, I can't find the right word. It's certainly not jealousy or envy. Those are not things that a Christian should do. But I guess I've always been frustrated that other other people seem to have these unique insights and visions and, and words from God. And perhaps uh, my faith at times was very intellectual and very dry. And, you know, why wouldn't God pick up the phone or send me a text message, basically, you know? <laughs> why couldn't he just tell me uh, what was around the corner? And then over the course of last year, through all these difficulties, on two occasions, you know, I'll never know whether it was my own subconscious or whether God actually spoke to me, but for the first time ever, I actually felt like he did. And there were, there were two occasions at church last year when I was praying my heart out, and I actually did feel God speak to me. Early last year, I heard the word courage very very strongly. And I thought, well, I'm not sure what that means, Lord, you know, courage because this is a, a long downhill slide you're about to start, or courage because there is a miracle at the end of this. But I just had faith and I, I stuck it out. And then, of course, there were those harrowing few months between that scan in November, which showed that I was on death's door, and the scan a few months later in January, which showed it was in full decline, the, the cancer and, and things were looking up. And that was this. I heard the words at church one day, you will live. That's it. No more, no less. And I just, I did not know what to make of that. And a few weeks later, we had the scan and sure enough. Still got Tony here. Um, courage. Is that what you receive when you have something of a vision like the one you had? Absolutely. I think uh, the vision. So when we're actually, I do a lot of volunteer work at a drug rehab centre and we're going through a season at the moment and of course be strong and courageous is so, is so obvious through that but uh, if I may say when when I was diagnosed uh, I resigned from work I gave uh, I was an independent uh, financial planner I just closed the door on everything and focused on my healing and what blew me away which Damien related to too, I'm sure is that in our little church I didn't realise that 400 people were praying for me uh, through the chain to get <laughs> Through the but the thing is that my children were anti the whole treatment. They didn't want me to. They wanted me to chemo and everything else. I didn't do any of that. I had the naturopath, uh, a chap called Frank. He's passed away now, sadly. But the first thing he said to me uh, when I saw Frank, I said, look, am I ever going to see my grandchildren? And he said, oh, yeah, we'll make sure that happens. And just that flippant remark, <laughs> and we prayed together as well, and he's a strong Christian man. But he got my uh, mercury out of my teeth straight away. That was the first thing. My toxin level were nine at that point after the surgery of uh, teeth, and there's not many dentists that do. Uh, my toxins dropped to six, so therefore my immune system was able to work on on the drops and the medicine that uh, Frank was giving me. No, no, there was no medicine or drugs, by the way. The yeah. doctors didn't like what he did. My naturopath, uh, he was phone call. He got a call from uh, uh, from the uh, specialist. He actually rang him and said, "What are you doing to?" Tell me what you're doing. And he couldn't, he, his face did not survive. I'm one, that, I'm one of about four that survived this. Tony, really Tony there's a lot of uh, different Hello. dimensions, aren't there? Uh, the sorts of things that you'd become aware of uh, when you know that there's a diagnosis like that. And uh, some of those that might even sound really quite strange, but uh, just removing uh, fillings out of your teeth uh, to uh, to alleviate the possibility that they might even be causing some sort of issue. Uh, a, a quick uh, comment from you, uh, Damien, just as we wrap up uh, Tony's call here. Uh, what, what are your responses to, you know, all of the things that you are now aware of if you've got a diagnosis like that and there's a lot of things you can do uh, that might be helpful along the journey? Well, you know, I think the, the reference to the teeth, it, it's an interesting one because certainly a lot I've done beyond uh, what the doctors might have expected me to do has been basically to try and get my body as healthy as possible. Um, you can't, I, I don't personally believe, diet your way alone into health, but certainly it plays a big part of it. So cleaning up my diet, which was, you know, a big issue, particularly when I was traveling interstate for the marriage campaign and everything else, be easy just to slip some junk food here and there or a quick soft drink or whatever else, you know, my wife would kill me if she heard me say that. But, um, you know, to get your diet back in order, to take all the supplements you can to try and keep your organs functioning because you'd be amazed how swallowing all these drugs can take such a toll on your liver. Um, earlier this year, I was warned that things were starting to look a bit 
bit shady for my organs just as I was coming good. But we're at a point now where I'm, I'm on that many supplements, I'm on a cup of pills twice a day, uh, that my doctor, who is a, a Christian as well, she tells me that uh, my bloods are now healthier than pre-diagnosis, which is an amazing outcome. But it points to the need, I think, you know, to, to take your health seriously uh, and, and to do as much as you can. Well, Tony in Mount Barker, thank you so much for your call. Uh, there still may be time for another call or two on one 316 Hey, when you were bouncing back, um, you reflect on the thought that uh, just recently uh, you like to walk and you like to walk while you're on the phone and uh, you accidentally uh, discovered that you'd walked 10 kilometres. Um, that must be a real triumph when you recognise that well, my, my strength is returning. And that came about in an interesting way too. I, it was the end of the day and I sat down and I thought, why on earth do my feet hurt so much? And I looked at the pedometer on my phone, saw the result and went, oh, there you go. I, I burnt a hole in the backyard basically. But yes, it, it was an encouraging sign and I'm seeing those all the time. It's been a, a bit of a, a paradox that as my health has been improving, there was a time when my symptoms, particularly early this year, were getting worse. And that was a result of many of the medications I was on. They were causing severe neuropathy. I lost all the feeling in my fingers, my toes. Uh, having to ask my own children to tie up my shoelaces was certainly a humbling experience. Um, and one which really causes me to reflect again and to be very grateful for where I am now. I'm not, again, out of the woods there in that respect. There are still some symptoms I'm dealing with, but I'm in a far better place than I was. And Loke, who had a brain tumour in his head, uh, hopefully you can hear there's no cognitive issues either. Um, I'm doing remarkably well. So a lot to think about there. Let's take another call. Carol is in New South Wales. Hey, Carol, welcome. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, the Lord says, go and tell what wonderful things the Lord has done for you. Hence my call, um, I don't know, maybe about 18 years ago, I was diagnosed with bowel cancer. And uh, prior to that, um, the Lord had spoken to me in my heart, a clear voice, to go and get diagnosed because over the radio at that time, they were doing it on um, a Medicare card, so in the city. So a girlfriend of mine who'd been nursing 33 years, she came in with me. And then um, it's supposed to have been a 24-hour let you know, but it didn't. they didn't let me know. Uh, but it, the bell didn't ring that I had cancer and they were waiting for the head um, uh, guy to come back on Monday. So anyhow, the guy came back and gave me a ring on Monday and asked me to come in. I still didn't think um, that there was any, that I had cancer. And as I sat there in the in the office there with the um, doctor and my friend beside me, she, she was reading the report and every second word was a long medical word that I didn't know. So I'd stop and ask her the meaning and my girlfriend who was a um, nurse she picked it up and she said to me carol wait till she finishes i said no i like to know as i'm going along to understand what's happened to me and then halfway through i just said have i got bowel cancer have i and she said yes i said could i have a look at it please so she took me to the computer showed it to me or she told me it was down the left side and um yeah, so I saw it. I didn't have any fear or anything. I just trusted God and uh, went to my doctor. He sent me to a private hospital. They just did endos endoscopies and colonoscopies. And, and um, the night before, I was very shy. I, I said, I'm going to be seen by a doctor and... Uh, I don't like that, a male doctor. I said, I'd rather die of the cancer. I was so shy. Anyhow, the Lord encouraged me, and so I went and uh, had the procedure. I had went into the hospital. Coming out of the anaesthetic, the nurse said, um, Carol, the doctor wants to see you in his rooms. So I went into the rooms after I was dressed and so on, and my friend sitting beside me, and he came in, um, uh, and he was dressed in his operating gear and so on. He's Carol, going, let me just uh, get cut in here, because uh, just to pick up on uh, the way that you were feeling when the diagnosis was coming, almost like, um, you know, you're not really ready to believe that, or you didn't 
believe that it was as serious as the diagnosis was. Uh, Damien, if we're, you know, a response here for Carol, but, um, you know, having faith in God prepares you in some way for bad news, and uh, some take it harder than others, but uh, in the case of Carol here, who wasn't afraid and uh, was just wanting to know, hey, just let me know, cut to the chase here, what's really going on? How do you uh, reflect on, on Carol and her experience? Well, I mean, speaking personally, I'd like to pretend I had no fear, but I'd be lying if I said that. Um, but I certainly think that having faith um, certainly prepares one better um, than would otherwise be possible, and perhaps for a lot of people who don't have that to fall back on. And I'm sure that was certainly the case for Carol, and it was, it was certainly the case for me as well. Carol, thank you so much for making your contribution today. Uh, let's just squeeze in one more quick call. Becky is in Queensland. Hey, Becky, need to be quick. What are your thoughts? Oh, hi. Um, lovely to hear of your healing. Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to just make the comment how interesting my dad's recently been diagnosed with cancer, um, stage three at the moment, and he's getting treatment for that. Um, but it's very interesting how everyone gives you their idea of what you should do to heal a cancer. Like, there's so many people like, tell you, oh, you should go on this diet, you should see this naturopath, you should go and read this book um, and do that. And um, it can be a bit difficult. (laughs) I think that's Um, difficult and it sounds tiring. Uh, There's a lot of challenges when everyone has their bit of good advice than everyone's expecting you to follow it. Um, Damien, your thoughts here for Becky and your own experience? Look, I I completely concur with that. I completely understand. It's very daunting to be confronted with with such a diagnosis, much less, you know, all the the well-intentioned people who try to give you um, their their experiences, their advice. If I had read every book and every article that people had thrown my way, I would have been dead (laughs) because the time simply would not have permitted getting through such voluminous stuff that was thrown at me. Um, At the end of the day, you know, they say, do your research, quote unquote. There's some truth to that. We have to be prudent. We have to pray. We have to to, to do our due diligence. But we're going to have to make that call at the end of the day. And it has to be something that we're comfortable with, we're happy with. Um, you know, I can only say from personal experience, it is daunting. It's difficult uh, to find what works. Becky in Queensland, thank you so much for your call. We won't take any more calls. Just to talk about the future for a few moments here, Damien, because, you know, lots of listeners, as I've described, uh, you were a champion of the marriage debate dating back to 2017. You've been at the helm of the Australian Family Coalition and uh, a great contributor, I might say, in lots of fabulous wisdom around the issues uh, over many years now, up until really uh, just uh, that that diagnosis and uh, when things looked like they were all over in November last year. You're back at the helm of the Australian Family Coalition, but it's not the only hat you're going to be wearing. Um, You're also, you've been elected as Vice President of the Liberal Party in South Australia. Um, there's, There's, all of a sudden, you're taking on a whole lot of good things. Well, people have said to me recently, you know, it looks like God has a plan for you. And I said, well, he certainly has a sense of (laughs) humour. You know, I would never have foreseen myself in this role, Um, certainly not over, you know, the the events of the last 12 months. Um, I've been involved in party politics in the background of of the pro-family work I've been doing for a long time because I do believe in leading by example. I've exhorted Christians for years to be involved in the political process. It's one of the seven mountains for people who choose to look at that paradigm And while I understand a lot of Christians, particularly in ministry positions, feel it's not appropriate for them to be involved in party politics, for me, I've always lived by the adage that I would never ask someone to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself. And if I'm in a position uh, to lead by example, uh, to get involved in the political process, uh, and if I've got this second opportunity, uh, God means for me to to be here a bit longer at least, uh, then I'll do everything in my power. And if this is uh, one more role, one more hat I can wear, then I certainly will. And politics has been very much a part of your history. You're a former deputy mayor of the city of Tea Tree Gully in South Australia. 
And uh, now you're back to uh, being in a place of influence, uh, Vice President of the Liberal Party in South Australia. And uh, in the meantime, you're going to be leading the Australian Family Coalition. Uh, Now, uh, people might not have received an email from you since November last year. Um, How does that go for people who've been subscribers, um, those who have been financial contributors, uh, those who've been wanting to see the best uh, and standing by the values that you've been espousing all these years? Um, How do people best connect with you now, Damien? Well, Neil, if I can quickly take an opportunity to do a shout out and thank Lana Gelanese, who did a fantastic job at holding the fort in my absence, and Lana will certainly continue to be involved with AFC. Um, In terms of connecting with us, please, if you're not on our database, join. Uh, We send out free regular emails. Uh, Our website is ostfamily.com.au. If you haven't had an email from us in the last week, please check your spam boxes. Please add us to your uh, trusted email list because what happened, of course, if you don't use an email for the best part of a year and then you try to email 50,000 people, spam filters go berserk. And we know that a huge number of emails, unfortunately, in the last week since I've been back on deck have not made it through. Uh, And that's now affecting our other email addresses as well, our office email. So if you've not heard from us, please look in all the recesses of your junk and spam folders uh, otherwise, perhaps if you're, you're not sure that you are signed up, re-sign at our website. And uh, you're always going to be looking for an extra friend or two who's going to be standing alongside and being a support, whether it's a prayer warrior or whether it's a financial contributor uh, or whether it's someone to respond to a campaign that you're running. And no doubt there'll be some more of those coming on the horizon very, very soon. For listeners, you can connect with Damien. You might even want to send him a personal message, Damien Wild, W-Y-L-D, uh, but you can connect with Damien Best at ostfamily.com.au. That's the website of the Australian Family Coalition, and that's where you'd be able to uh, get onto that email list, uh, become a subscriber to the good work they're doing, and undoubtedly in the times to come, we're going to be having Damien back, and we'll be talking much more about uh, the ethics and the politics and uh, where things are at, and uh, as a Christian, how do you stand on all sorts of very confronting issues, because those issues continue to deepen And uh, we are always uh, excited about getting great commentary and we're going to get lots more of that as Damien Wilde has bounced back from being days away from death and uh, we will give glory to God uh, that in God's sight uh, he has not finished with Damien Wilde yet and uh, who knows that might be a roller coaster still to come for Damien in all of the pursuits that he has. But Damien Wilde, It's just been great getting your insights and thank you so much for being so open and sharing your journey uh, through what is a traumatic experience, Uh, but you're back on track and we're looking forward to good things ahead. But thank you so much for sharing these things with listeners today on 2020. Thanks, Neil. It's great to be back. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 